This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. As we continue with part two of our conversation on the wildfires raging through Southern California, raging towards the coastal cities on the weekend, the fires have scorched some 230,000 acres of land and forced nearly 200,000 people to evacuate. At least one woman has died so far. There are some injuries reported. The wildfires are already the fifth largest on record in California and the largest ever recorded in December. Of the largest 20 wildfires, the last five have occurred since September. Climate experts say the intensity of the winter blazes is linked to climate change. Authorities have warned residents to stay inside those that haven't evacuated because of the dangerous air quality caused by smoke and carcinogenic ash from the fires. But a number of farms have stayed open, sparking concerns farm workers are laboring in hazardous conditions without proper equipment. Last week, volunteers handing out free protective masks to farm workers say they were kicked off some farms arms, despite the fact the pickers were asking for the safety equipment. Well, for more, we are continuing with our two guests in Southern California. Via Democracy Now! video stream, Lucas Zucker joins us from Ventura. He was evacuated last week due to the fires. Zucker is Policy and Communications Director for CAUSE, Central Coast Alliance United for Sustainable Economy. He helped distribute respirator masks to farm workers who continued working despite hazardous air quality conditions. And by phone, we're joined by Democratic California State Assembly member Monique Limon, who represents Santa Barbara and Ventura County. Um, Assembly member Monique Limon, can you first talk about the situation where you are? are in Santa Barbara. What is happening? So the situation in Santa Barbara um, and Ventura counties is actually quite um, horrific. Um, we've had over 230,000 acres burn, approximately 270 square miles. So that's just bigger than the area of Boston, for example. Um, and uh, the you know we're facing a fire that's still burning only at 10 percent containment we're facing about 95,000 people that through this week-long fire have had to evacuate um, we're facing uh, 790 uh, structures that have been damaged or destroyed uh, so so there's a number of issues that our community is facing including the fact that these these fires have caused um, particularly uh, challenging uh, kind of uh, air quality concerns for us um, our air in this particular area has been deemed bad to hazardous in certain parts of this county because of the fires. Have you been forced to evacuate, Assembly Member? So I have not been forced to evacuate uh, myself. I do have family members who have been forced to evacuate. Um, but I have been uh, in this district. I represent nearly half a million people in this particular part of the state of California. And I have um, now uh, gone to some of these sites where we've lost uh, hundreds of homes, uh, sites that have, uh, you know, that have been threatened. And um, it's something that uh, I've been working on every single day um, in terms of making sure that people have resources and know the information. So this is um, something that, as someone who grew up in this area, born and raised in this area, um, our area has not seen a fire of this magnitude. We're very accustomed to fires. Um, regrettably, we have them, um, you know, every year. Um, but this, this is something else. This is this is a much bigger magnitude than we've ever experienced in this area. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Bill McKibben tweeted that of the 20 worst fires in California, the last five have been since September. This is the only one, and this is the fifth largest at this point um, in California history, and the only one in December. Um, scientists linking the intensity of these fires to climate change. Um, the significance, uh, State Assembly Member Monique Limon, of the President of the United States um, saying that climate change is a hoax, and what that means for California. Well, I'll tell you this, for, I think, folks uh, not just in California, but in other parts um, of our country, when you see, you know, six to seven years of drought, uh, you know, very high uh, temperatures, uh, not enough rain, um, you do understand that um, our contributions to what we're doing um, to our climate and, and, you know, the human contribution is definitely having an, an impact. Um, you know, this is real. 
This is absolutely real. Um, and again, the conditions, uh, because of the lack of rain, because of the drought that this particular area has been experiencing, um, are conditions that are absolutely impacting the area. Our firefighters um, and public safety officers repeat to us at every single point where they're giving our community information that the conditions of this particular area um, are contributing to a much more intense fire, and that is real. So let's talk about what's happening to the farm workers, uh, and let's bring in Lucas Zucker, who himself was evacuated. Um, he's with CAUSE, Central Coast Alliance United for a Sustainable Economy. Can you talk about what you're doing right now? You yourself already evacuated, but in trying to get respirators to farm workers, is it true, Lucas Zucker, who are being required to continue to work, um, even despite the air quality? Talk about what you found. That's right. So, despite the extremely dangerous air quality right now from the wildfire smoke, uh, there are thousands of farm workers still out working in the fields uh, of our region without N95 protective masks. <laughs> Um, public health officials recommend people wear these masks, even if they're just going outside to, to walk to the store, let alone do heavy physical labor for long days in the fields. Um, and farm workers are really faced with this horrible choice um, between giving up the income that they, they desperately need at a, at a time like this and, um, and endangering their, their health and safety uh, at work without the proper protective equipment. And um, so we've had dozens of volunteers going out uh, every morning to the fields and giving out masks to farm workers. Um, we've also been mobilizing our community uh, to push Cal OSHA to take action and really protect the, the health and safety of these workers. Explain what Cal OSHA is, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, California. So Cal OSHA is the, the agency tasked with protecting the, the health and safety of all workers in California. Um, but they had actually closed down their regional offices uh, after after the fires broke out. Um, and so we had uh, this this really massive public outcry uh, against that. We have calls flooding in the, the Cal OSHA offices and, and our, our state legislators really, really working to, to get them open. Um, it's just incredible to have thousands of uh, farm workers out in the fields in, in dangerous conditions uh, working while Cal OSHA, the, the agency tasked with protecting them, is not working. So what farms have you gone to where have you been prevented from handing these out? Uh, we did have some some hostile confrontations. Um, you know, some some farms we were we were escorted out. You know, with a you know with a truck driving behind us, and um, you know threats to to call the sheriff. Uh, the majority majority of farms we have been able to to get get mass out, but um, you know there's there's been some some tense moments with um, some of our, our volunteers who are especially you know high school students as young as 15 who are giving out the masks. That's right. And what happens if a farm worker says that they do not want to work now, that they're afraid? So, so farm workers do have the have the right, um, especially if there's there's kind of two or more to to you know ask ask for the day off um, in these in these conditions. Um, <clears throat> but ultimately, what you know what we've found is is you know folks have been have been going to work. Um, you know, it's it's a they're they're in a really tough, vulnerable situation, and a lot of farm workers are afraid of their you know their their income, their job, their immigration status, um, and so they're um, they're they're faced with a with a very difficult choice here. Are the emergency often not much choice at all? Are the emergency warnings in Ventura are they also written in Spanish? Does the county write them in English and Spanish? No, the vast majority of emergency information has been only easily accessible in English for evacuation orders, fire parameters, safety notices, uh, road closures, emergency shelters. Uh, and actually, the main clearinghouse of information, readyventuracounty.org, uh, has has been in, in English. With if you scroll way to the bottom, there's a there's a little a little tab that you can uh, use Google Translate, um, which as <laughs> as folks folks who are uh, you know. Bilingual, no. This is, a, you know, this is basically translation done by bot. Um, it's it's not very helpful. Um, we we asked our uh, our office of emergency services to to do translations. They said they they don't have time to. Uh, they 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 just can't can't make live uh, regular updates in Spanish the way they they make regular updates in English. Um, and and Google Translate is the best that we're going to get. So they they put a. Um, a, a line, kind of an awkwardly translated line at the top of the page, um, kind of explaining to people how to use Google Translate.
Earlier this year, farm workers in Washington state demanded justice and safe working conditions after one of their colleagues fell ill and died after picking berries in a field near the Canadian border. The 28-year-old father of three, Ernesto Silva Ibarra, was working for San Banan uh, Farms this summer amid scorching temperatures and smoke from nearby wildfires when he began complaining of intense headaches. Silva's colleagues say uh, supervisors denied his request for medical attention, ordered him to keep working or be fired. Silva later collapsed while seeking help and was rushed to a hospital in Seattle, where he died in August. At least 70 workers were fired for insubordination when they organized a one-day work stoppage to protest Silva's death in dangerous conditions in the fields. Um, do you know about this, Lucas Zucker? And um, do farm workers along the coast, are they aware of these situations? That's right. Incidents like that are definitely forefront on our minds right now as we're working to ensure the health and safety of farm workers. I think that um, most most farm workers out in the fields now probably haven't heard of these inf incidents um, and and may not may not know the severity of the risks they're facing. And that's that's why we're getting out there to talk to them. And can you talk about the avenue in Ventura? Just what the avenue is? That's right. Uh, the avenue is Ventura Avenue. It's kind of the the corridor along Ventura's west side. It's a it's kind of a, a, a densely populated narrow uh, narrow community surrounded by by steep hillsides on both sides. The wall of fire kind of climbed down and and just barely was stopped before before hitting apartment buildings. Uh, it's a community of about thirteen thousand people, about seventy percent Latino. Um, it was a community under mandatory evacuation orders for five days, um, with uh, you know dangerous air quality. Uh, you know, just just had clean, safe drinking water restored, um, but the the vast majority of residents uh, were actually still living there, uh, either never left or or you know returned home after after leaving immediately that first night. Um, so we've been working to get out get out air masks as well there. So, Assemblymember Monique Limon, as you listen to this description of what's happening on the farms in Southern California amidst these horrific wildfires, these historic fires in California, can you talk about what you're doing, um, first around the farm worker safety and, and then in general? Are you talking to the farm workers, talking to the um, growers? What, what agreements are being made now? Right. So actually, we we played a role in um, contacting Cal OSHA um, and uh, making sure that Cal OSHA was available, but not only available to those in the community to ask, you know, in terms of questions about safety and you know working conditions, but um, that they were um, in a position to also make sure to uh, properly inform and advise those particular uh, farms. And so Cal OSHA. The uh, agriculture commissioner, um, as well as the uh, you know the, the growers association, the the berries association, um, were all contacted by our office in terms of saying it's really important for us to make sure that those on the ground have the correct information about worker safety. Um, and you know there was I think on the first day um, there were uh, some farms that actually let their uh, farm workers go the second day. We're still working on making sure that people have, um, you know, masks, um, the appropriate N95 mask um, if they're outside uh, working. I think one of the things that um, Lucas alluded to is the challenge of, um, you know, the need for income. And this is going to be a continued kind of conversation about what happens when your need for income is such um, that you are now in a position to really not feel like you have an option, um, even though the law says you have an option, and that's particularly difficult. Um, so on that front, um, I think that there's been multiple legislators um, who have had this conversation. I know that uh, when, a, you know, when the locals kind of got a hold of this, there was a lot of questions being asked. Um, so among, you know, the, the multitude of uh, complications and challenges and emergencies that we're having in this particular area related to the fire, that is definitely, um, you know, something that's very important to us. Um, on, you know, on, on the bigger issue in terms of, uh, of the fire and what our office is doing, you know, as, as someone who represents this particular area in the state, our office um, continues to try to get this information to folks. And I will say that anyone who goes to any of the information that I've released, um, you know, we've done our best um, as someone, you know, who was born in this country, um, but who's been bilingual my entire life. 
um, to get information out in, in both Spanish and English, which um, are the two uh, languages predominantly, not the only ones, but predominantly um, spoken in this particular area of California. Um, and so we've been, you know, making sure we've been talking to folks. Um, you know, there's been times where we've been at press conference and I've been the only one to say something in Spanish. Um, but it's an issue. We're not uh, we're not dropping this issue in terms of getting information out to the community um, in, in ways that um, they can actually interpret and make the best decisions in terms of what they're going to do. Um, so this is something that, again, this fire has presented a number of um challenges, um, emergencies, imperfections, things that have not um, gone as we would have liked them to go, right? Not the script um, that we would have liked them, um, but we don't drop them. We address them, and we make sure that as we move forward in the legislature, um, we are considering, um, you know, all of these things and making sure that um, it's, you know, it's, I think our governor said it well um, then this week in terms of when he came out to visit the area, he said that this is really the new norm for California. So if this is the new norm for California to have these wildfires, um, then we must make sure that that norm changes um, for our entire community. What about people who are concerned about evacuating because they're concerned they could, if they went into a shelter, they would be picked up by ICE or they would be picked up by authorities? When we were in Santa Rosa and the fires in Northern California, uh, people were afraid to leave their homes. Some people were fleeing to the ocean. Um, what are you telling people, and what is ICE doing right now around these issues? So this is actually something that's come up um, in the community uh, already. And so we're working with the Red Cross, with the volunteers, with everyone involved to make sure that they get the right information out um, and, and saying, you know, and, and that information is that anyone can come to the shelter. You don't need um, to provide a driver's license or proof of anything else. Um, and this is something that actually impacts all communities. There's people who left their home without being able to grab um, their, you know, belongings and information. So it's really important for us to make sure that they know that the evacuation center is a safe place for them. Um, we've also seen that the Mexican consulate has been visiting all of these um, uh, evacuation centers with the hope to provide um, information, resources, but also bilingual translation um, in cases that's needed. I know that I've run into officials working in the Mexican consulate, and while they, you know, a Mexican consulate um, is here to, you know, help Mexican nationals, that has not been the case. Um, they have helped anyone who has needed Spanish and bilingual um, translation, citizens included. And so I think that that's something that's really important. But it is something that we have heard. Um, it's something that we know is a real threat. Um, in, in terms of a fear that people have um, in the community and reasons why they may not want to go to a shelter. So we're really trying to um, ensure that that information gets out to our community as a whole. So in these Red Cross shelters and other shelters, they are not allowed to ask for ID? Could you continue uh, with that in English? Okay. Um, uh, in these, uh, no, in these evacuation centers, they do not ask for IDs. And so this is information we have verified. Um, um, that they they do not ask for this information. Um, this is not information um, that they uh, need. They just need a, you kind of a name and last name to know who's there. They need a count, of course, um, but they don't need to have that information um, to be able to access uh, emergency shelter. And what about this issue that Lucas Zucker has raised of um, the lack of Spanish translation of the warnings and the advisories being translated into Spanish on the government websites? What is being done? right now to fix that? Right. So, uh, you know, the ask was immediately, like, get something up there in Spanish and English. Um, we also have a statewide system. It's called the Nixle uh, text system, which does give people the ability to opt into a Spanish text message. Um, and so, you know, the, the conversation uh, continues. I know that uh, I sat in a meeting yesterday uh, for Santa Barbara County, and uh, the Congress member and I uh, brought, you know, forward this same particular issue of what's being done to get this information in Spanish. Um, I think we're going to have to have uh, continued conversations about what we do long term in the immediate, because the need is such. I have to tell you that anyone who speaks Spanish, including myself, 
is doing everything possible to get that information in Spanish um, to folks. Um, that's the immediate short term, like I need to get someone information. But the long term is we're going to have to really set some state policies and standards about how we get information out, um, particularly in areas um, where we know we have you know, a large number of people who speak a different language. Um, and, and that's going to be very important. Um, and it's important for the whole community. Um, safety is an important thing for everyone to be informed about what the practice, the evacuation plan is, how they should think about um, these issues. It really makes the community as a whole. I mean, we saw this in the evacuation process in the city of Ventura. Um, you had so many people evacuating at that same time. Um, so to, to make sure that everyone has that information is key. It's key to the safety of the whole entire community. And uh, finally, Assemblymember Monique Limon, how has Driscoll's, the world's largest berry distributor, uh, responded to the wildfires and to the farm workers who work um, uh, in the area? So they, um, you know, once they and once they were informed, they immediately actually uh, put out a, um, a statement. Um, about uh, about you know the whole condition and um, they you know in their statement they uh, they acknowledged that they were going to be taking um, you know next steps in terms of, uh, of those folks I think uh, of, of working with uh, the farm workers and safety like I said initially that first day when it came out um, they, they, they let folks go home. Um, uh, once kind of the situation was elevated to a lot of different um, agencies and folks, um, hope folks went home. And so um, it is our hope that uh, Driscoll's and, um, you know, other berry growers uh, will continue to really see uh, what we do in the long term um, when we have folks who, you know, uh, are very much uh, impacted by what is happening when their work is outside. Mm. Well, I want to thank you both for being with us, uh, Assemblymember Monique Limon of Santa Barbara and Ventura and Luca Zucker uh, with the Central Coast Alliance United for a Sustainable, Sustainable Economy, or CAUSE. You can also go to our website to hear a conversation in Spanish about this dire situation, at this point the fifth worst wildfire in California's history. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman.